Welcome to this YSL tutorial on SQL Server Reporting Services 2016. This video is going to give you an overview of how to use shared and embedded data sources in your reports. We'll begin with a very quick comparison between embedded and shared data sources, and then jump right into it and configure a basic embedded data source. We'll look at how to set up a connection string and give you a quick overview of the basic authentication settings. We'll then look at how you can create data sets based on that data source and then generate basic reports from those data sets and before we finally deploy them to a report server. Once you've done that, we'll move on and look at how you can configure a shared data source, how you can then set references to that shared data source in a report and then again generate data sets and basic reports using that data source before we deploy those to the report server and have a look at some of the more interesting things you can do with a deployed data source. So we'll have a look at how you can modify the connection string, how you can overwrite it and replace it with, an, with a a different version and how you can also delete your shared data sources from the report server. So a few things to do here, let's get started. Now just before we get started with the main part of the video, there are a few things you'll need to make sure you've done first. So we have a little playlist called SQL Server 2016 Getting Started that will help you out if you need help with any of this, but you'll definitely need to make sure of course that you've got a copy of SQL Server 2016 installed, and this little video here shows you how to do that. You'll also need a couple of management tools, so SQL Server Configuration Manager and SQL Server Management Studio, so that video tells you how that works. You don't need to all the rest of the information, all these extra videos you don't really need unless you're desperately interested, but you will need to copy the YSL Movies database as well, and there's a link in that video's description that helps you to download a copy of the, the script for creating the database. And then finally, you'll also need to make sure, of course, that you've got SQL Server Data Tools installed. If you've done all that already, then great stuff, we can head straight into the Start menu, and I'm just going to open up Visual Studio 2015 from my quick shortcut in my Start menu. You can search for it as well, of course, or just scroll through the list of all programs. And when the application's opened up, what we're going to do is start a brand new report server project. So when the first, when the, uh, the home page appears or the start page appears, I'm going to click the new project link on the left hand side. And then from the list of templates, I'm going to go to the business intelligence category, choose report server project. It doesn't really matter where I store this for the purposes of the video, but I've got, got this set to, so that it will be created on my desktop. We can change the name if we want to. I don't really need to at this stage. I'm going to leave it with the boring name of report project one. And then if I click OK, we'll end up with a brand new report server project. Last thing to do just to get started before we can create a data source is we want to create a basic blank report. So if I right click the reports folder and choose add followed by new item, that will just avoid going through the wizard that will be launched if we choose add new report. So I'll choose add new item and then from the dialog box that appears eventually, I'm going to choose report. And again, I don't care about changing the name of the object. I'll leave it called report one, click the add button. And then eventually when the report has been created, we'll be able to get on with creating our data sources. Now, of course, the whole point of creating a report in reporting services is so that you can display some data from a database in an interesting way. But of course, you can't display that data until you've first of all created a connection to that database. In reporting services, those connections are referred to as data sources. And there are two main types that you can create in reporting services. One's referred to as an embedded data source, and that's one that is contained within a single report and is only accessible to that report. The other type of data source is referred to as a shared data source, and that's one that's created at the level of the entire project and is accessible to any report in the entire project, as well as other reports that are deployed to the report server. So once you've deployed the shared data source, any report on the report server can reference it. We're going to start with embedded data sources for this video. They're slightly easier to create and deploy, and then we'll move on to shared data sources a little bit later on. Just to demonstrate which database we're going to create our data source to point to, we should have an application installed called SQL Server Management Studio, certainly if you follow the videos in that little series that I showed you earlier on. So I'm going to open up SQL Server Management Studio, and then when the application launches, I'm going to connect to a named local instance of SQL Server. So I've got a named instance called SQL 2016 Training, which is installed on my local machine. I'm going to connect to a database engine and then click Connect. And then you'll be able to see in the list of databases, if I just simply expand that folder, I've got a database in there called Movies, along with one or two other ones from various other courses and projects I've been working on. But Movies is the one that we're interested in for this particular video. What we'd like to be able to do is create a connection to that database so that we can then extract some data from the various tables contained in it. So let's get started by doing that by heading back to Visual Studio and having a look at how to create an embedded data source. 
you can start creating an embedded data source using the report data window. That window should have appeared when you first chose to create a new report, but if it's not there then just make sure that you've clicked somewhere inside the report design area and then head to the view menu at the top of the screen and choose report data or just press ctrl alt and d on the keyboard. Anyway, once the window has appeared, look for the data sources folder in there and simply right click on it and choose the only available option, add data source. And that will display the data source properties dialog box that helps you to configure this data source. We should give this data source a sensible name, so just to distinguish this one from the shared data source we'll create later on, let's call this one Movies Embedded. You can then choose what type of connection you're trying to create here, so by default it will point to Microsoft SQL Server, and of course reporting services is part of the SQL Server suite of tools, so that kind of makes sense. But depending on exactly which providers have been installed on the machine you're working on, you might have a, a slightly longer list of different connection types you could create. We're going to be sticking to Microsoft SQL Server of course for this video, so let's leave it set as Microsoft SQL Server. You could then, if you know how to write out a connection string from scratch, you could simply type it into this little text box here where it says click here to type or paste a connection string. But it's much more convenient for us if we use the little edit button to launch the query connection string builder. So I'm going to click edit and then that will open up a second dialog box that helps me to configure the connection properties. Now the first thing we should do is specify which server our database is stored on. There's a tempting looking drop down list here but often when you click on that drop down list, if I just choose to do that, it takes forever to try to populate itself and then I often end up with absolutely nothing in the list anyway, I often get a not responding message as well. So just while that's trying to sort itself out, what we're going to do instead is type in our server name. If I just switch back to SQL Server Management Studio, I've got a local named instance of SQL Server called SQL 2016 Training and the name of my local machine is listed here, that's the, uh, that's the server name for, for our purposes. So I could just type out that entire server name followed by a backslash and then the name of the instance of SQL Server I was interested in. But it's because this is installed as a local server, it's actually slightly more convenient and easier just to type in local host, followed by a backslash and then SQL 2016 training. It doesn't matter, it's not case sensitive, so I can type it in in all uppercase or all lowercase or a mix of the two. It's actually even more convenient, rather than even typing in local host, I could just replace the word local host with a full stop, which is a shortcut to the local machine. So that's a fairly convenient way to, to refer to the specific instance of SQL Server on which your database is stored. If you've done that part correctly, what you should find then is that you can simply select your database name from a drop-down list. You don't have to do this at this point actually, you can just create a connection to the server or the instance of SQL Server, and then later on specify where your data comes from in the data set. But for the purposes of this video, I'm going to select the Movies database, and this drop-down list does actually work. If I click on the drop-down arrow, that will show me a list of all of the databases available from that server. So I can choose Movies, and then let's have a quick look at some of the authentication settings. Now you'll notice that the authentication property has been set to Windows Authentication by default. And all that means is that when somebody tries to access this data source, the data source will use that user's Windows credentials. That's definitely the right choice for this particular example because that's the way that we configured our SQL Server when we first installed it. If you followed the video series about installing SQL Server, then you will have done the same thing if you followed my instructions. Um, if not, then you might have a different setting applied. Just to check on that, we could switch back to SQL Server Management Studio, and then we could right-click the top node here in the Object Explorer and choose to view Properties. On the dialog box that pops up, there's a security page, and that will tell you which type of authentication mode you're using. So currently I'm using Windows Authentication Mode, and that's all tied into the logins and users configured when we first installed SQL Server. Another option there might be SQL Server Authentication Mode along with Windows Authentication, which means you can set up specific usernames and passwords as part of the security settings for your SQL Server. I don't want to get into all the detail behind that at this point, there is more information about that on as part of the SQL Server 2016 Getting Started started series, so there's a, a video there about logins, users, roles and schemas which contains information about how this works. For now we're definitely going to be using Windows authentication for our, our particular data source. Let me just cancel out of this, uh, this server properties dialog box, switch back to Visual Studio, I can click test connection if I just want to reassure myself that it's going to work, luckily it does, if I can then click OK and click OK one more time, you'll see that the connection string has now been written out for us.
Now before we click OK on this dialog box, it's worthwhile mentioning that we've just seen that you can modify the authentication settings using the Edit Connection String dialog box, but you can also do it from the Data Source Properties dialog box too. If I switch onto the Credentials page here, you'll see that it's set to Use Windows Authentication. We could have also said Use this username and password, so if I were to choose this option here, it would actually affect what we saw on the Edit dialog box for the Connection String. If I switch back to the General page and then click Edit, head to the authentication option, you'll see that it's changed to SQL Server Authentication and then I need to enter a username and a password and that must match one that's been set up in the security folder for this particular SQL Server. As I say, this one isn't the, the correct option to choose in this case, so I'm going to switch this back to Windows Authentication here and then click OK and switch back to Credentials on the Data Source Properties dialog box and you'll see that it's set to Windows Authentication here again. Now there are a couple of other options you could choose here as well. You could choose not to use credentials at all, which is no good for us in, that, in this particular case because of the way our SQL Server has been configured. You could also choose to prompt for credentials. So what that would mean is that a dialog box would pop up every single time somebody tries to run this report, asking them to enter their username and password. So that can be their, their Windows username and password, so it can still use the Windows credentials. It just forces the user to enter those. So I could type in my own specific prompt text and that would display on the dialog box asks the user to confirm their identity. Alternatively, it will just use some sort of default text like enter credentials or enter details, username and password. For this example, as I say, using Windows authentication is definitely the right one to go for. There are other reasons you might want to consider the other options, which we'll talk about in later parts of this series. The main one being if you wanted a report to be set up to run automatically without anybody logged in, so an unattended execution of a report. That's mainly used for things like subscriptions. So we'll talk about that in a later part of the series, but for now, hopefully you're, you're happy and comfortable with that this is definitely the correct setting to use. So at that point we can now click OK and we have our basic embedded data source finally created. OK, so at this point we have a data source pointing to our movie's database, but we're still not at the point where we can actually display any data in the report, simply because a data source itself doesn't return any data. Think of a data source as more like a connection or a pipeline along which data can flow. It doesn't actually contain data itself, but it allows data to move from the database into the report. To actually get some data using that data source or that connection, we need to create something called a data set. Now I'm going to cover this at a very basic level in this video. We'll have a, a separate video that explains a lot more about how data sets work. But just to begin with, I'm going to right click on the data source that I've just created, and then I'm going to choose Add Data Set, and then I'll get another dialog box to fill in. But the important thing here is that it's already selected my movie's embedded data source. I'm not going to bother changing the name of my data set, I'll leave it called Dataset1, and I'm going to use the Query Designer very quickly to select a simple table or two from my main movies database. If I were to click this little Add Table button at the top of the dialog box, I can then select a couple of tables, so let's go with the Film table for instance, and perhaps have the Country table, and maybe the Genre table, and that will probably do, maybe the Certificate table as well, let's have a Certificate, and then I can close down the Add Table window. Again, I'll explain a lot more about how this query works or this data set works in a later video, but just for now I'd like to check a few basic boxes. I'm going to have the title box, the release date, and then another couple of columns. Let's have the runtime in minutes and the Oscar wins. Quite topical actually, based on what today's date is. We've just seen the, uh, the Oscar winners announced this morning. And then we can have the country column from the country table, the genre column from the genre table, and finally the certificate column from the certificate table. The query will be written out for us down in the bottom part of the dialog box, but again I'm going to focus on this in a later video, so let's just click OK for now, click OK one more time, and now we have a data set which we can finally use to display some data. In order to actually make use of the data in the data set, I need to insert some sort of items into the report, and we saw this in the brief sort of introductory video in this series about how to create and upload your first report. So just very quickly, let's insert a couple of basic items. I'm going to right click somewhere in the report design canvas and then choose insert, and let's start with a basic matrix. Once I've inserted a matrix, I'm going to assign some basic fields to the various areas. So for the rows area, I'm going to drag the genre column from my data set and position that in the rows area. I can then drag, let's say, the certificate column. I'm going to position that into the columns area. And then in the data area, I'm going to drag in, let's say, the runtime in minutes. And then, actually, beg your pardon, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to drag in the title column. And I'm just going to count how many films there are for each combination of genre and certificate. I get the title 
field filled in, but it doesn't give me any sort of aggregate. So what I'm going to do is click onto the word title, which will highlight the word in blue. Then I can right click on that, choose summarize by, and then choose count. So that will simply tell me how many items there are for each combination. Alongside that, I could insert maybe a basic chart as well. So let me just right click somewhere into the blank part of the report design canvas again and choose insert. And then I'm going to insert a basic chart. And when I do that, I get to choose what type of chart I'd like. I'm going to go with the basic pie chart and click OK. And then I'm going to click somewhere inside the chart and I'm going to choose to specify that the category groups will be the certificates. So I'm going to click on the drop down arrow here and choose certificate. And then for the values in the chart, again, I would just like to count how many films there were. So if I click into the plus symbol at the top right hand corner, I can choose title and that will automatically assign a count this time in the chart. I could just resize the chart area just a little bit to make it a little bit more readable when we finally see the results. One last thing I'd like to do, if I just click and drag at the bottom of the page, bottom of the report page, just to give myself a tiny bit, little bit more room, I'm going to right click again into a blank part of the report and choose insert and then choose table. And this time I'm going to select a few basic fields from, from my data set. I can choose title, I can choose release date, and I can choose, let's go for Oscar wins. And then let's just change the width of some of those columns so it looks a little bit more easy to read when we finally see the results. And having done all of that, I would just like to see what the report looks like when I run it. So I'm going to hit the preview page at the top just to see what my fairly hideously basic report is going to look like. So it shouldn't take too long, but this is rendering the report. And finally, we get all the data displayed based on the values stored in that data set. Now, although this report is fairly basic looking, I'll freely admit, I don't really care too much about the formatting for this particular video. What I'd like to do next is upload this report to the report server and then view it in the report manager application through a web browser, just so that we can compare this one with the version that will use a shared data source later on. So to do that, we'll need to configure the report, uh, the report project to deploy the report to the correct report server. Let's start just by closing down this report. The report will already have been saved when we previewed it, so we shouldn't get asked to save any changes. What we can then do is right click the report project name in the Solution Explorer window and then choose Properties from the context menu that appears. We need to make sure that we're pointing to the correct target server URL. So currently we'll, we've got one that says localhost report server, which isn't quite correct for the particular instance of SQL Server that I've installed. So what we can do to view the report server URL or get the specific report server URL is open up a new instance of SQL Server Management Studio. What I would like to be able to do here is connect to my report server. If I go back to SQL Server Management Studio and then choose to connect to a reporting services service and then click connect, that will happen. It will connect to the reporting services service or report, reporting services server, I should say. But if I try to view its properties here, if I right click, I'm blocked from viewing its properties because I'm not running this application as an administrator. So I'm just going to disconnect from that. And in fact, I'm going to close down SQL Server Management Studio altogether at this point. There's no need to keep that instance open. If I head back to my start menu and then right click on SQL Server Management Studio, choose more and then choose run as administrator, confirm that I'd like to allow it to make changes to my machine. And then eventually when the application does load again. I can connect this time rather than to a database engine, I can connect to a reporting services instance. It should have set that automatically having just manually connected to a report server in the previous instance. So if I click connect, what I can now do when I see my report server node, I can right click on it and I can choose properties this time. And the report server URL for this particular instance of SQL Server will be listed right there. I can simply copy that to the clipboard, close that dialog box, head back to Visual Studio, and then I can paste in my report server URL into that box and click OK. The next thing I can do is deploy this report project, but I'm going to run into a similar sort of issue that I've just had with trying to view the report server properties. If I try to right click on my project and then choose deploy, the process will begin, but it will fail fairly rapidly immediately afterwards. So I'll get a, an error to do with permissions being granted to this particular user, which is not particularly handy. So I'm just going to hit the, uh, the error to clear it and then close down that error list and close down the output window. And then what I'm going to do is close down the whole of Visual Studio using the cross in the top right hand corner. What I can then do is head back to the start menu and find my Visual Studio shortcut, right click, choose more, then choose run as administrator, click yes to allow it to make changes. 
when the application loads into the start page or the home page, I'm going to choose to open up a recently used project. So when it does finally appear, there it is. I should have a list of my recent projects. So there's one there called Report Project 1, which is the one that I was just working on. Alternatively, I could go to the file menu and choose Recent Projects and Solutions and choose it from that list, or even just choose to open a, a project or solution and browse for it, but far more convenient just to click the one in the recent list. So if I were to do that, I'll open up this enormous project with uh, with my whole single report in it. What I should be able to do now, however, is right click on the report project at the top of the uh, top of the solution explorer and then choose deploy again. And this time I should see not an error message, but a list of success messages. So deploying a single report, no errors, no warnings, that's now succeeded. What I'd like to do next is view that report using the Report Manager web portal. So to find the URL for that web portal application, I can head to the start menu, and again, if I've installed SQL Server in the same way that I described in the short video series about getting started with the SQL Server, I should have another application here called Reporting Services Configuration Manager. I'm just going to launch this tool normally and then click yes to allow it to confirm, uh, to confirm that I want to allow it to make changes. Make sure I'm referring to the correct report server instance. So the one I'm using here is SQL 2016 Training and then click connect. And then there's a separate page on the left hand side called Web Portal URL. If I click there, that will give me the URL that I need to browse to. Now really annoyingly, I can't right click and copy this to the clipboard, which is what I really want to be able to do. I can't select that text in the dialog box either. The reason I'd like to be able to select that text is because if I just click onto it, it's going to try to open up my default web browser, which is Google Chrome as it turns out, and then try to browse to the web portal, but it's going to give me an error message saying that I'm not allowed to view this folder. Exactly the same reasons that I couldn't view the properties of the report server or deploy the report project in the first place. I'm not running this browser as an administrator. So what I'm going to do is click OK to clear that message. I can take that URL, I can just select it and copy it to the clipboard for the time being. What I can then do is just open up either Google Chrome or even another web browser. It really doesn't matter which browser you choose to use these days for reporting services. I'm going to use Internet Explorer just for something slightly different. So I can right click on the application, choose more, then choose run as administrator, choose yes to allow it to make changes. Have a quick look when it loads, click into the address bar, paste in the URL that I've just copied, hit enter to browser there, and what I should find very shortly once it's loaded is a brand new folder called report project one and if I click into that folder I should have a single report there and if I click onto that report it will show me all of the information all the the objects that I designed before the matrix the chart and that fairly boring looking table so there they all are the important thing about this, having used an embedded data source, is that everything that this report requires is all contained in one single object. There's nothing else to consider here. This report just gets moved around. If I wanted to move it, it could be moved around, and everything required to run the report would move along with it. So that's one of the nice things about embedded data sources. Everything self-contained in one single item. Now there are a couple of small downsides to using embedded data sources. Primarily, you need to create a brand new embedded data source every single time you create a new report, which gets a little bit tedious if you're always connecting to the same database. Also, if you decide to change anything about your data source, maybe you change the name of the database for some reason, or change um, maybe the server on which it's installed, or maybe change some credential information, then every single embedded data source that previously pointed to your original database on your original server will need to be updated as well, and that can be really tedious. So that's where shared data sources come in. It's a single data source that lives on the report server, basically, and multiple different reports can point to that same data source, which means that you've got a single thing to manage, basically. You've got one single item that you can modify, and that will affect numerous other reports. So let's have a quick look at how we can design a basic shared data source. We'll connect to the same movies database, but we'll do it as a shared data source. If I switch back to my report project in Visual Studio, I'm just going to clear the output window, and then before I do anything else in terms of creating new reports, I'm going to create a new shared data source. And you can do that in the Solution Explorer window. You don't even need a report open to do this. So I'm going to right-click my, my shared data sources folder and choose Add New Data Source. So as you can see, the dialog box for creating a shared data source is virtually identical to one for creating an embedded data source. We can give the data source a name, so let's call this one Movies Shared, 
and then we can choose what type of connection we're going to create. So of course we're going to connect it to a SQL Server database, but all of the other providers that are available to us as well, based on which providers have been installed on your machine. We could type in a connection string, but it's far more convenient just to edit using the dialog box and then again type in the server name, let's type in full stop backslash SQL 2016 training or if you've used a slightly different instance name then of course use that instance name. Again same sorts of options for credentials or authentication, I'm using Windows authentication for obvious reasons. We can select our database name from the drop down list although we don't have to do that but it makes sense to in this case. And I can click test connection just to make sure that it's going to work, I can then click OK, click OK again my connection string will be written out for me and then of course I've got the credentials page which would allow me to modify credentials so for situations as I mentioned earlier on where perhaps you want to have a report that runs unattended to, as part of a subscription to generate emails or output files then you might want to consider a different option here again we'll talk about that in more detail in a later video in the series just for now I'm going to click OK and that will generate my new shared data source which will live in this little folder up here with the .rds extension just to demonstrate how to use that shared data source, let's create another report or two. I'm going to right click on my reports folder and then choose add new item and I'm going to select report from the list. I'm not going to bother changing its name report to, although it's a fairly rubbish non-descriptive name, I'm going to leave it as report to and click add to generate a brand new blank report. Now I do need to add something to the report data data sources folder, but I don't have to go to the extremes of specifying the connection string and all the credentials again. All that information is stored of course in the shared data source. All I'm going to do is create a pointer or a shortcut to that shared data source by right clicking data sources in the report data window, choosing add data source. I could change its name here if I like, maybe let's call this one um, ref2movies shared, something along those lines. And then I don't need to set up an embedded connection, of course. What I want to do here is use a shared data source reference. So I can select that option and then from the drop down list, select from all of the shared data sources that belong to this project. If I choose that option, there is a credentials page available, but I can't modify anything on here, of course. All that's used, all that's stored in the shared data source, so all the credential information is set, is set up in there. So although I can browse to that page, there's nothing I can do there. All I need to do here is just click OK. So it's really just a case of selecting the shared data source from a drop down list. It's as simple as that. The icon for a, sh for a shared data source reference is slightly different to one for an embedded data source. It's a little sort of shortcut icon indicating that it's a pointer to something else. But from this point on, everything else is exactly the same. So let's create a new data set that belongs to this data or that uses this data source. I can right click on that data source and choose add data set. And then I could change the name if I wanted to. I don't really care about doing so in this example. Let's head to the query designer again. And what I would like to do here is create a report that contains the film table and let's say the country table and then just close that window down. I'm going to display the title and the country and then click OK and then OK again. And all I'm going to do then is insert a basic chart into the report. So I'm going to right click and choose insert chart and then I'm going to make this a basic pie chart. Actually, tell a lie, I'm going to make it a basic clustered column chart, so that box standard uh, column chart, fairly boring box standard one. I'll just increase the size of the chart to make it a little bit more readable. And then I can click into the chart and I can set up a couple of basic properties. So I'm going to set the category groups so that that's set to country. And then I'm going to set the values so that that's a count of the film titles. That'll be overwhelmingly biased towards the United States, of course. So if I just have a quick preview of the report, you'll see that this chart is overwhelmingly in favor of the USA. I didn't actually list, I didn't actually note that on the chart. We're going to deal with charts in a huge amount more detail in later parts of the series, but just for now I wanted something that would generate some basic output. I'm going to close down that report there, and then I'm going to create yet another new report using the exact same shared data source. So the beauty of this now is that whenever I want to create a new report or a new item that belong that uses that movies data source. I don't need to create it again from scratch. I can just create a new data source in the report data window that points to that shared data source. It's as simple as that. I don't even need to rename it. So I can click OK. Then let's create another basic data set. I can right click on that data source, choose add data set, and then let's use the query designer. This time let's choose something like, let's go with certificates and films and then close that down. I can check the certificate box, check the title box and click OK and OK again. And let's insert another basic chart just to demonstrate the principle. 
you can carry on creating as many of these as you like by the way this is just for the most basic type of demonstration to to show you what this will look like when we finally deployed the project so I've got my pie chart I'm going to set the details to be certificate and then I'm going to add in the title which will give me a counter title for each certificate give that a quick preview and there's my little breakdown I'm not going to bother doing any formatting although I would love to because I hate that color scheme but anyway let's leave it as it is for now I'll, I'll close down report number three and there we go we have a couple of basic reports both using our shared movies data source. What I'd like to do next is show you what happens when you try to deploy a report that uses a shared data source. Now earlier on we deployed the entire report project which would deploys every single item in there and when you've got a whole great big long list of reports and objects to deploy that's the most sensible option to choose. When you're adding new reports one by one, you might only want to deploy one single report at a time. But we're going to have a problem with doing that for this particular example. When we use a shared data source, you can only deploy a report that uses that data source if the data source itself has been deployed. So just to demonstrate what I mean by that, if I try to right click on report number two and choose to deploy it, what's going to happen is it's going to fail, telling me that it can't deploy the report because the shared data source doesn't exist. So what we need to do here is either deploy the entire project or deploy the data source and then the reports. So of course the most sensible option would be to deploy the entire project. I could right click there and deploy the entire thing. Bear in mind that that would overwrite any existing copy of report number one. That might be appropriate in this case. Alternatively you could choose to deploy the individual data source and then the report. So I could right click on my movie's shared data source and choose to deploy that first and that should succeed. And then I can right click on report number two and then deploy that and that should succeed. Let's do the same thing for report number three. I can right click and deploy that and then that will be all the objects required all deployed to the report server. Just before we go and have a look at these reports and the data source in the web portal application, it's worthwhile mentioning that once you've deployed a shared data source once, by default, you're prevented from overwriting that by trying to deploy it again. So if I try to deploy either the entire project or just that shared data source again, if I right click and choose deploy, this time I'll end up with a failure message. It says, I can't deploy data source movie shared to the server because it already exists and a specific property has not been specified. So it may be the case that you wanted to have modified your shared data source and redeploy that to the server, in which case you would need to modify a quick little setting of the report project. So if I were to right click on the report project and choose properties, in a dialog box that appears there's an option there that says overwrite data sources, which is set to false by default. You can change that to true and then click OK. And then if I right click on my shared data source again and choose deploy again, this time it will tell me that it succeeded properly so there's no warning message about it not being able to be deployed. Okay so to see this data source and the associated reports on the report server we could head back to our web portal application in in my case Internet Explorer but you might have chosen a different web browser <laughs> why wouldn't you and then I'm currently browsing into my report project folder so if I just switch back to the home page first of all what I'd now like to do is refresh the home page by just either pressing F5 or clicking the refresh button on the toolbar and what should happen this time is I ought to end up with two separate folders so there's the one with my report project reports but I've also got a separate default data sources folder and that's where the shared data sources for your entire report server will live so if I click on the data sources folder that will show me my movies shared data source if I click onto that that will display another dialog box showing me all the information about that data source so you can see the connection string has been written out there for me and it shows me any other credential information etc. I can test the connection, I can modify it, so I can actually change various different things about this data source even now that it's been deployed to the report server. I can also see which items depend on this data source. If I click dependent items it should show me that these the, the shared, movie shared data source feeds report 2 and report 3. So I can have a quick look at the, what data those display and again that will just show me those basic boring charts. I could go back to the previous page and have another look at report number 3 instead and that will show me that's <laughs> slightly less hideous, more hideous, I'm not quite sure. Maybe I'm getting used to those colours. Um, if I wanted to look at all the reports in the entire report project I could either browse directly to that folder using the breadcrumb at the top or I could go back to the home page and then click into the report project folder and I can see all three reports. So of course this one doesn't use a shared data source, that still uses its embedded data source. This one, or these two, use my movie's shared data source.
Now it's worth mentioning that once your shared data source has been deployed, you can make changes to it which will then subsequently affect any reports that rely on it. So for example, I've actually got a couple of different instances of a SQL Server installed in this particular machine. If I browse back to SQL Server Management Studio, if I connect to my original database engine which was SQL 2016 Training, that's where I was basing all of my queries, all of my data sets and data sources on when I was designing my reports. Now that might represent perhaps a test server where you have some test data for creating your basic reports in the first place. But when you've deployed your reports and they've gone live, perhaps you want to force those reports to use the production server. So let's imagine that I had another server, which I do have if I connect to another database engine. And this time I'm going to connect to my just uh, an instance called SQL 2016. So without the training extension, if I connect there, then I'll see that I also have installed in this instance of SQL Server a movies database. So this could be a perhaps a, a production server as opposed to a test server. So what I could do, because there are so few changes, essentially it's just a change in the instance name that I need to modify here to update the, uh, the, the shared data source. Back in my web portal application, I could browse back to the home page of the web portal and then browse to data sources and then browse into movies shared. And then all I would need to do is modify the connection string. Sadly, it's not quite so easy to do here. I don't have a nice little dialog box to edit the connection string. But I could, because it's such a simple change, I could just edit the connection. So it's just called, pointing to an instance called SQL 2016. And then I could choose to test the connection, which will hopefully work, connected successfully, and then apply those changes. And now what will happen is that whenever I run report 2 and report 3, if I browse back to, let's just see the dependent items, in fact, if I click dependent items, report 2 and report 3 will now use data stored on the other instance of SQL Server rather than the original. Now, sadly, the databases are exactly the same, so there's no way to see that this is the uh, this is uh, happening. But um, you can just have you'll just have to take my word for it, or indeed test it out for yourself if you prefer. So worthwhile knowing that you can modify the shared data source once it's been deployed to the report server, and that will of course affect any reports that rely on that data source. But of course, any that use embedded data sources will still be using their box standard original data. One final thing just to be ever so slightly careful of, related back to the idea that you can choose to overwrite a shared data source when you deploy a project. If I switch back to Visual Studio and I were to deploy my entire project this time, let's, let's say I made some changes to all of my reports and I wanted to deploy them all. What would happen in this case if I right click my report project and choose deploy? that will copy all three reports as well as my shared data source and of course I set the report project property to allow data sources to be overwritten. So that will mean that if I switch back to my web portal application and head back to the home page and then browse back to my data sources folder and look at movie shared you'll see that this has now been overwritten again and it's reverted back to the SQL 2016 training instance. That's not necessarily a bad thing that might be by intent. All I'm saying here is just be aware that you might have that effect if you're uploading and overwriting your shared data sources. Just to wrap up this video, I'm going to do a tiny little bit of tidying up on my report web portal application. So I'm going to switch back to the home page and I'm simply going to choose to delete all of the objects, both the report project and the shared data sources folder. You don't have to do this. I'm just tidying up so that I've got a fresh version available for the next video. So I'm just going to use a little ellipsis button, the dot 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 at the top right hand corner of report project one and choose delete and then confirm that I would like to allow that and then do exactly the same thing for the shared data source. So I'm going to write, oh, sorry, just click once on the ellipsis button and then click delete and that will allow me to remove all of those objects. So that leaves us set up nicely for the next video in the series. Hope you found this one useful. Hope you gained a bit of an insight into what the difference between shared and embedded data sources is and how to use them to their best effect. Thanks for watching. See you next time. If you like what you've seen here, why not head over to the YSL website where you can find loads more free resources including these videos, some written blogs and tutorials, and even some exercises that you can download to practice your skills. Thanks for watching, see you next time.